one of the most well-known frontline defenders of democracy in the Hong Kong protest movement. Uh, if you saw images from the famous umbrella movement, they were probably from her. She brought attention and the world's attention to the cause of a very unique uh, movement organizing technique uh, in Hong Kong and continues to do that work now as the Hong Kong campaigns coordinator for the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. We are honored to welcome her to the stage, give her a, a good round of applause. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, it's really nice to, again, like see real people. I'm still getting used to that in general. Um, I'm Chung Cheng Kwong. I'm an activist born and raised in Hong Kong, and I'm currently living in self-imposed exile in Germany for obvious reasons, because what's happening in Hong Kong. Um, can I please have the slides, please? No, I guess. <laughs> I, I'll just go on and we can catch up with the visuals and everything. Um, in 2019, a mass scale social movement broke out in Hong Kong. I'm sure a lot of you have seen on the internet or on television where there are uh, police brutality, mass protests in the streets, one million, two million people on the street. And for your reference, that's a quarter of a population. And imagine if it's in your country, one, a quarter of the population went onto the street. The government would have stepped down, I think, two or three times already. But not in the case of Hong Kong, because we don't have genuine democracy. So what happens is, as the COVID pandemic hits Hong Kong, the government took the chance. Is on street protesting, it's kind of like slowing down and lost some of the momentum. They passed a draconian law called the National Security Law, which criminalizes basically every political movement or act, uh, activities on the ground. If you are on the ground protesters, you're basically a terrorist. If you like me talking to all of you, I am basically colluding with foreign forces, meaning that you are all my accomplices with or without consent in that case. And if you are engaging in other policy advocacies, you might be seen as like promoting sedition and other things. So it became quite problematic in Hong Kong right now as we have lost the freedom of speech online and we're heavily surveilled in the city. The national security law provides the government and law enforcement with huge power to put everyone under surveillance without sufficient ground. And they don't need a court warrant anymore. They can simply have our chief executive, which is the leader of our city, to consent, and they can do it. And while our chief executive, again, is not democratically elected, or in another way you can say they are puppets of Beijing, they can actually do anything that they want in that case. And at the same time, they are trying to put Hong Kong into a black box situations. In many places, there are, um, a lot of restrictions on online spaces. For example, multiple websites are being blocked. A UK-based organization called Hong Kong Watch, which monitors Hong Kong freedom and democracy, are being blocked so nobody can actually access it without a VPN in Hong Kong. At the same time, under the national security law, there are legal liabilities for online service providers and internet service providers. They have the obligation to comply with content removal requests from the government and data requests of the government. Failing to do so will result in imprisonment or fine. Worst of all, the government have the power to seize the servers or anything that they use to host the content so that the government can take them down themselves. So online service providers and internet service providers are being put in a situation where they have to choose whether or not they're going to uphold the values that they claim to defend, like freedom of speech online or, or other rights of expression, or they are risking to completely leave the market because they face criminal liabilities under the national security law. A lot of the internet serv online service providers have 
like promise that they will not turn over data to the Hong Kong government after the law was enacted in Hong Kong. Like Twitter, oh. like Twitter, Google, Facebook, they said they're not going to do that. But very recently, a report found that Google has actually turned over data to the Hong Kong government under a different sets of norms that they have like within their internal policies, which become hugely problematic. Because I think Google know myself better than I do in certain ways. They know what I like. They can basically deduce if I'm having a breakup, judging by how often I listen to Taylor Swift or like whatever that I'm looking at on the internet. And this is hugely problematic. And I know this sounds like an overstatement, but we are actually seeing the direction of travel, uh, the travel of Hong Kong's digital rights and digital freedom moving towards into a direction of Xinjiang. Hong Kong is reflecting the architecture of repression in Xinjiang right now. The visual is showing you the demonstration of something called Smart Prison Initiative in Hong Kong. They are installing cameras in prison sales, where a lot of my friends are being kept right now. And they're installing voice recognitions on phone inside prisons where prisoners used to contact their families or their lawyers and so on. And they are requesting some of the detainees to wear a wristband, something that we have to wear when, like, um, when you're in a COVID quarantine. Some, like suddenly became something you have to wear in prison so that they can track your location, they can track movement, or even record what's happening. At the same time, when you're on the streets, if you're luckily not being arrested for your political activities, when you're on the streets in Hong Kong, you are being surveilled. There are cameras everywhere. I was doing a research on the ground in Hong Kong about surveillance on university campuses and other places that you would expect privacy, like parks. And surprisingly, not actually surprisingly, but surprisingly enough, there are a lot of cameras, and a lot of them are actually capable of facial recognition according to like, how they look, what kind of brand they belong to, and what kind of model that we can observe like, on the ground. And the government actually have access to facial recognition technologies that are being imported from foreign countries. And those companies provide them with sophisticated trainings, telling them how they maximize the use of these systems so that they can actually track protesters down with facial recognition or analyze the image for other uses. And there are like stop and search happening on the streets. You, you're easily being stopped on the street if you're wearing all black, for example, because this week is the week of the, the, um, the anniversary of the Tiananmen massacre. You get stopped on the street. And even though it's against the law, the authorities have the power to ask you to unlock your phone because you risk arrest or being taken back to a police station. So they ask you to open their phone, and they look into the content of it. They look if you have Telegram, if you have Signal, who, who you've been talking to, what are you following on social media to determine if you're going to have a hard time or not. And at the same time, we have COVID restrictions, like COVID apps that we use to scan a QR code just like we do in Europe. But the different thing is the app is not open sourced. We don't know what's happening behind the app. And at the same time, our law provides for data transfer to China without any check and balance. So basically, any data collected in Hong Kong of Hong Kongers or foreign citizens can be legally transferred outside of Hong Kong, despite we actually do have GDPR and like, the implications do apply. But because GDPR is a European law and had never been an extraterritorial application yet, nobody knows what actually happens to the data in that case. And many other things that is happening in Hong Kong, like there is a widening scope of sedition. There are medias being charged with sedition because they are hosting certain contents that are deemed inappropriate or encouraging subversion of the Chinese Communist Party. And they face a minimum of two years in prison, like even though it's not as serious as the national security law. And there are many law amendments that are hindering free speech online. For example, the government is now proposing a copyright amendment, which provides 
no exam not enough exemption to works like memes online, which is I think not only for Hong Kong, but for everybody here, like a really important way to express your political opinions or just general discontent about life, about COVID or other stuff. And at the same time, um, there are like laws, like fake news laws that are being proposed in Hong Kong. And it sounds very normal to have fake news law. It sounds like a nice thing, right? Like there are a lot of fake news and disinformation and we do need to address them. But the thing is, in the context of Hong Kong, it became problematic. Like, who gets to determine what actually is genuine news? Is reporting about June 4th massacre and the commemorations, is that news, real news in the case of Hong Kong? The government would certainly say nothing have happened on 4th of June, 1989. So that's fake news. We're going to take it down. And so Hong Kong kind of enters into that black box situation where no news comes out because everything the government doesn't like is fake. And whatever we do as activists or act, uh, political activities on the ground will easily not be reported. And journalists will engage in self-censorship saying that, oh, doing that might risk my whole bureau in Hong Kong. Maybe I don't do that. So this is the whole thing, the whole situation that's happening in Hong Kong. Basically, we're living under fear and self-censorship. But like, that's my city and my story, right? Like I'm telling you about a place that's quite far away from Brussels. So why should you care? The reason why you should care is because it's not just Hong Kongers' loss. The loss of all those digital freedoms, online freedom of speech, is a value that we all treasure. And this is our way of life that we w wish to uphold. So it's basically, your loss to a certain extent too. And because you all play a role in it too. The reason why I say you all play a role there is because your laws and policies do have impact on Hong Kong. Like the heated debate about encryption in the United States will have an effect on if we as activists get access to encrypted communications, whether or not I get to talk to my loved ones and families back in Hong Kong whether or not I actually have safe ways to communicate ideas with people who might be living in authoritarian states. Like for example, like Belgium is talking about banning encrypted um, communication tools because they want to implement a law that's uh, to replace the ECJ rejected data retention law, a data retention act. I can't remember the exact name of that law. So the impact is other European countries might follow and me residing in Germany would have a problem of trying to communicate with my friends who are still in Hong Kong safely. Because technically, I'm a criminal. And they would be in trouble if they were found out that they're talking to me. And other regulations, like data protection regulations, like GDPR, has an impact, like a, set, a standard for the rest of the world to follow and observe. Antitrust laws, like if we, only act, we can only access technology through certain platforms like the Apple App Store, the Google Store. An app doesn't actually exist if they're not on the app stores. And I am clearly not tax savvy enough to actually know how to sideload things on an iPhone because I really lack the, like, mind, the, the brain power to understand that most of the time. And standard setting. China, it's very eagerly participating in standard setting in all sets, in all walks of the world, especially when it comes to technology. Are we aware enough of the impact that it might have on our life? If an authoritarian regime like that gets to set the standard, we might all be like deeply in trouble. And another thing is the business model of companies that we use. Like as I said, like Google definitely can predict when I'm having a breakup, right? Like, Letting Google know that it's kind of bad enough, but when commercial surveillance and governmental surveillance work hand in hand, this is my worst nightmare. Like going through a breakup is bad enough, and then having Google know it, not really nice. But what if the Hong Kong government can request the data from Google one day, and then they will know, okay, she's under a lot of stress right now. Let's do something to her, or let's keep it on a file so that we know exactly how she's performing, what she's doing, and what she's up to, who she's talking to, who she's emailing, or who is she drunk texting or whatever. 
that becomes a huge problem. And one of the solutions to that, even though it sounds super naive and super unachievable, is data minimization. If we can develop new business models that does not sell users as the product, it might change something. It might change the way we interact with services, we interact with different products in the world. And you are also at stake. I'm so sorry about that. In the European Union, the 20, there is a judgment called Schrems II judgment that is laid down in 2021, would actually allow cross-border data transfer from European Union to any third countries under that set of legal requirements, including China. Meaning that your data can be actually transferred legally to China, no matter like, what happens to it. For example, if you're using TikTok, their privacy statements provide that they will transfer data to their mother company, BitDance, which is located in Beijing. And by law, any entities in China are obliged to transfer data to the Beijing government as soon as they receive a request. So basically, European data, even though we have GDPR, the best data protection regime currently, our data is still at stake. And the product you use, I'm not so sure if you're aware of there is a scandal in the UK during COVID times, that is, the health minister, the former health minister was having an affair. And nobody knows exactly where it's, like, where did it come from? Like, where does the leak come from? But a lot of media was emphasizing the camera that captured it is actually Hig Vision. And out of other reasons, like, because Hig Vision is so heavily involved in Xinjiang for slaver camps and building a surveillance system, the, um, the UK health minister decided to ban Hig Vision in general. And the UK has already banned Hig Vision because of its human rights, like, involvement in human rights violations, too. The online services that we use, TikTok, WeChat, they all practice content moderation. Like, what does it have an impact on us? For example, Australian politicians heavily rely on TikTok because of the population of Asian and Chinese in the country. And then some of the content get blocked. So it's not only Hong Kongers or Chinese citizens or Uyghurs, Tibetans, freedom of speech are being hindered. To a certain extent, your way of life is being hindered under this kind of situation, too. And also, like, I'm here to make you slightly uncomfortable so that things would change for the better, is that we all play a part in indirect involvement in oppression. Many companies in Europe have enabled oppression to happen, not only in Hong Kong, but also in the Xinjiang region, when it comes to forced labor, mass surveillance, social credit system. Siemens from Germany and Telefonica from Spain, they helped the Chinese government to build that mass surveillance system leading millions of Uyghurs being detained in re-education camps and practice in forced labor. And then this kind of huge mass surveillance system is being exported to other places under authoritarian rule. Are we actually doing enough to stop them? Are we actually addressing the problem when we say the European Union as a whole or the free world as a whole are trying to defend a rule-based world order? and trying to defend human rights in general. Many companies across the world actually provided the Hong Kong police force with technologies, with trainings, so that they can crack down on me and my fellow activists and my fellow Hong Kongers. Are we ready to actually do something to change it? So I would love to ask you to do a few things. Other than the things that are written, I would really love to ask you to step up your security game to a certain extent, because I'm not sure if you have friends who live under oppression or in general stepping up the security game will benefit the whole community, not just you here, but many other people in the world. You as consumers have a role to play in stepping up the security game and demanding better privacy. And I wish if there are any policies maker in the room or anyone who works in policy we will work together to ban entities that are involved in human rights violation from government procurements. We should in no way allow human rights violations at this, like companies that are involved in human rights violation be benefiting from taxpayer money. I think if you grab a random passerby on the streets and ask them, do you actually want to take part in 
like oppression and stuff, I think clearly everybody will say no. So why are we actually turning a blind eye to the problem? And ban entities from being involved in human rights violations, set up due diligence laws, regulations, to require companies when they're practicing to actually be aware of human rights conditions in different places so that the things that are happening in Hong Kong or in other places will not worsen. And also be aware of your laws and your policies, meaning that your choice as a citizen to vote for someone in the elections actually have an impact on us. And I wish that everyone in this room and globally will rank human rights higher than most other things because this is the common value that we share, and this is the common value we should all work to defend, no matter the costs. Thank you.